Hi, I'm Pablo Rodriguez Fernandez. I'm currently a research scientist at MIT's Plasma Science and Fusion Center, also called the PSFC. My research, in addition to all of my colleagues here, has to do with exploring or learning about amazing features and applications of fusion and harnessing this knowledge to create fusion energy. Now, what is fusion? In this video, we will explore many different concepts of fusion in order for us to better understand what fusion is and how it works. Fusion is a physical process where nuclei of light elements, like hydrogen, combine to form heavier elements, releasing enormous amounts of energy. In this case, we have two hydrogen isotopes forming to create helium and an energetic neutron particle. In order for this reaction to occur, the hydrogen nuclei, which are both positively charged, must overcome strong repulsive forces in order to fuse together. Fusion also powers the Sun and all other stars in our universe. Since the discovery of fusion in the early decades of the 20th century, scientists have speculated about harnessing it as a power source on Earth. The challenge is that the Earth doesn't have the massive amount of gravitational force, like the Sun, that allows for the high pressure conditions needed for fusion. Instead, one of our Earth-bound solutions is magnets. So, how are magnets the solution? Well, we need to learn a little bit more about the matter that makes up a fusion reaction, plasma. Plasma is often referred to as the fourth state of matter. You're probably already familiar with solid, liquid, and gas. Well, as you know, once you add enough heat to a solid, the solid will eventually melt and become a liquid. If you add more heat to the liquid, the liquid will vaporize and become a gas. And as you'd expect, if you add enough heat to the gas, the gas particles become so energized that the electrons are stripped away from the atoms, forming an electrically conductive gas called a plasma. Sometimes plasmas are also referred to as a soup of charged particles, where electrons and nuclei, also called ions, go around interacting with each other, but not bound in the form of an atom. Plasmas naturally exist all around us, most of the visible universe is made of plasma in the form of stars and galaxies or the glowing gases surrounding stars. On Earth, lightning and the auroras are naturally occurring plasmas. Man-made plasmas are also common in neo or fluorescent lights or electrical arcs, like in welding. But the plasmas we require are a bit more complicated to create than those in lights and welding torches. In order to create fusion, we require extremely high temperatures, about 200 million degrees Celsius. Unfortunately, there is no material here on Earth that can withstand these temperatures. For this reason, we need to figure out a way to control the plasma so it doesn't touch anything and can be insulated or confined in a vacuum environment. In fact, this is not as hard as it sounds because plasmas are electrically conductive which means that they can be controlled with externally applied magnetic fields. If you remember, electrons are responsible for current and electricity, and because they are charged particles, they can also be controlled by magnetic fields. Because of this, you can control a plasma using magnets and electromagnets. This video shows that a simple permanent magnet can move a plasma and, if we wrap a wire around the plasma tube and have an electric current running through the wire, the plasma is constricted into a tighter beam. This means that we can push the plasma away from the walls of the tube, which adds more thermal insulation between the tube material and the plasma itself. Now, this plasma is operating at low temperatures, but when it comes to plasmas needed for fusion energy, the amount of thermal insulation required is much, much greater. The magnetic fields in fusion experiments come from powerful electromagnets, which are currents running in coils of conductive wire. You can wind the conducting wire into a cylinder to form a solenoid, which has straight uniform field lines running lengthwise inside the cylinder. Plasmas can be well confined in these straight, uniform fields. However, high losses occur at the ends of the tube where the field lines begin to bend. How can we get rid of the ends? To solve this problem, researchers arranged the magnets in a circle, with the field running continuously around inside. This way, there are no more ends to our tube and no more end losses. The result is the familiar toroidal or donut shape, which is typical of fusion devices. 
The method used to confine plasma with magnetic fields inside a donut-shaped vacuum chamber is called magnetic confinement fusion. And nowadays there are two main types of magnetic confinement devices that have successfully achieved magnetic confinement and are candidates for future fusion power plants. On the left side we have the tokamak, which has a central solenoid and planar electromagnets around the torus. On the right side we have the stellarator, which does not have a solenoid in the center, but that has electromagnets with a complex 3D shape. The differences between the tokamak and the stellarator designs are due to the different methods scientists and engineers developed to confine the particles and energy in the plasma. The tokamak design utilizes a central solenoid magnet inside the donut-shaped plasma to maximize performance. It turns out that the toroidal magnetic field lines we showed earlier aren't the most efficient way to confine the electrons and ions in the plasma. Due to the curvature and inhomogeneity of the toroidal magnetic field, particles would just drift away and hit the walls of the donut-shaped chamber. In order to prevent this loss, we can form the magnetic field in a helical shape instead of a toroidal one. This way, the particles not only follow circles around the major axis of the torus, but they also go around the small axis. To create this helical shape, the tokamak uses the central solenoid magnet to induce a very large electrical current, made up of millions of amperes, using the same principles as a transformer shown in this image. In contrast to the tokamak design, the stellarator design does not induce a current in the plasma. Instead, it produces the helical magnetic field shape directly using external magnets. With a bit of math, you can show that this approach requires the magnets take on complicated shapes. Over the years, we have built hundreds of these devices, and nowadays we keep researching fusion and plasmas in experiments all around the globe. The scientific community has gathered more experience with tokamak devices, mostly because they are easier to design and build, but we have stellarators around the world that are also providing great results. Most tokamaks and stellarator fusion experiments have been built using electromagnets wound with traditional electrical conductors, such as copper. Copper electromagnets work great for fusion experiments that last for short time durations, but they are limited in operating time because copper can get very hot very quickly when running at high current. In order to scale up from short pulse fusion experimental devices to longer run times needed for fusion power systems, a new type of electromagnet is needed, and this is where the superconductor comes in. A superconductor is a material that does not exhibit any electrical resistance. Check out this diagram here. The dashed red lines represent the behavior of a normal conductor, such as copper or aluminum. When a normal conductor sees an increase in current, there is a linear increase in voltage. This is due to the resistance of the conductor. Because a superconductor sees no resistance when it is in its superconducting phase, it sees zero voltage with increasing current. However, a superconductor is not perfect. If it operates above its critical current, temperature or magnetic field, it will begin to transition and become a normal conductor. This critical state is important because it dictates the operating conditions of the superconducting material. Most superconductors need to operate at very cold temperatures to stay in its superconducting state. Low temperature superconductors such as niobium-10 or niobium-titanium need to operate at very cold temperatures, around 5 Kelvin or minus 450 degrees Fahrenheit, which requires cooling using liquid helium. Tokamak designs such as ITER were designed around these types of superconductors. Recently, a new type of superconductor has been developed and commercialized, the high temperature superconductor such as REPCO or YBCO. High temperature superconductors, or also called HTS, can operate at much higher temperatures compared to low temperature superconductors. For example, HTS can be cooled using liquid nitrogen with temperatures of 77 Kelvin or minus 320 degrees Fahrenheit. In addition to operating at higher temperatures, HTS can also operate at significantly higher magnetic fields which allow the designs of smaller or higher performing tokamak devices. You can really see the difference between the operating capabilities of superconductors and a normal conductor. As an example, I can run the same amount of current in this one inch thick copper cable in this 100 micron thick HTS tape when in liquid nitrogen. How amazing is that?
One very important question you may have is, how can we heat up a plasma to the extreme temperatures of 200 million degrees C required to create these fusion reactions? In Tokamax, as we said earlier, the central solenoid induces a very large electric current in the plasma to keep the particles and energy confined. These induced currents also help heat up the plasma. In contrast to a superconductor, plasmas do have a finite amount of electrical resistance. And when current runs through a normal conductor, joule heating is generated from the resistance of the material. This means that when the induced current is going through the plasma, heat is also generated due to collisions of electrons and ions, which helps heat up the plasma. However, it turns out that as the plasma increases in temperature, the resistance decreases. Because of this trend, we can only achieve temperatures of a few million degrees using resistive heating, which is far shy of our 200 million degree goal. One way to reach this high temperature goal is by launching electromagnetic waves into the plasma, which is similar to the way our kitchen microwaves heat up food. Using this same principle, we use specially designed antennas to launch waves with millions of watts of energy at a certain frequency where they resonate with and heat up the plasma. In addition, we can also launch beams of very energetic particles that collide with the plasma and deposit the energy. In fusion pilot plants in the future, and soon in tokamak experiments like ITER and SPARK, plasmas will undergo a very fascinating phenomenon. Remember the fusion reaction that we showed at the beginning? The fusion reaction produced a neutron and a helium nucleus. Both contain the energy released in the fusion reaction, and both are useful for us. While the neutron does not have an electric charge and will leave the plasma, as it is not affected by the magnetic fields, the helium particle, however, will remain as part of the plasma. Because this helium particle has a lot of energy, it will go around at high speeds and will collide with the rest of particles, giving part of its energy after each collision. This means that as long as fusion reactions occur, the plasma will heat itself up, requiring little to no energy input from the outside. Pretty neat. Now, let's look at that neutron that left the plasma because it is not affected by magnetic fields. Most of the energy released in the fusion reaction is contained in this very fast particle. What fusion scientists want to do in future power plant devices is to surround the plasma chamber with a material that can stop this fast neutron and absorb its energy in the form of heat. This heat can then be used to heat up water and make it go through a turbine to produce electricity, same way as in other power plants nowadays. But instead of combusting fossil fuels or splitting uranium to heat up water, we have fusion reactions in a hot plasma providing the energy. Fusion has many advantages over other energy sources. One of these advantages is the abundance of fusion fuel. Like we mentioned earlier, the fusion reaction we use is between two isotopes, two types of hydrogen, which are deuterium and tritium. We can extract deuterium from seawater pretty easily. However, tritium is a bit harder to produce since it's not a stable isotope. Remember our little lost neutron that we used to heat up water? Well, it turns out that if neutrons interact with a lithium blanket that's located inside of a tokamak, tritium is produced. So the tritium fuel cycle is then a closed loop cycle and the only fuel needed for a fusion pilot plant is then deuterium from seawater and lithium from the Earth's crust. And most importantly, we only need very small amounts of these two things because the fusion reaction is so energy dense. Only half a bathtub of water and the lithium in one laptop battery can give enough energy for an average family for 10 years. Fusion has the great potential to become a clean energy source capable of replacing the baseload power generation that is currently produced by burning fossil fuels that are harmful for the environment. With fusion, we will be able to supply enough clean, abundant and safe energy to the world for centuries to come. Let's build our star on Earth.